Hi, I'm Michael Ryaboy, a developer advocate for KDB AI, and welcome to the series on KDB AI and vector databases. In this video, I'll be going over vector search, why it's important, how it works, and its practical applications. Well, why is vector search important? 80% of all data is in the form of text, audio, video, and images, which are traditionally difficult to search and interpret. Now, relational search methods typically fail for unstructured data, and there's a few reasons for this. The first is that tagging unstructured data accurately is challenging and often complete. What this means is that if you're taking data and then parsing tags from that, often those tags won't accurately represent the full data. Another reason is that it's difficult to efficiently find and compare similar items. What this means is, let's say a user is reading an article and you want to recommend similar articles to the one the user is currently reading. With relational search methods, it's not immediately clear how you would do this. Another problem is that generating meaningful tags from user queries is complex and error prone. If you're taking a user query and just parsing tags from that, you could completely miss the user's intent and frustrate them. Now, finally, many similar items may match a search, but there may be no effective ways to rank them. Let's say you got 100 results that are relevant to the specific tags that you parsed from the query. Well, it's difficult to rank them in an effective way, which means a user experiences cluttered results that are very difficult to interpret. Now, the solution is to represent our data as vectors. Machine learning models can map our data into a vector space where similar items are closer together and dissimilar items are farther apart. This enables numerical comparisons between our items. Now here on the left, you see a two-dimensional vector and a three-dimensional vector. But in practice, our vectors are gonna have hundreds of dimensions. And this is because every single data point in our vector, which is every single column in our vector array, is gonna have some semantic meaning. And with enough dimensions, we could capture the unique and complex semantic meaning of our data point, whether that's an image or text. On the right, you see a visualization of film embeddings. This is based on taking a bunch of plot summaries, embedding them, and then mapping them to multidimensional space. When you map them by genre, similar items will be close to each other. And this pattern is even more profound at the higher dimensions. Vector embedding models convert unstructured data to semantic vectors. And there are two types of models that are state of the art right now. And they are BERT and GPT models. And they both convert your data into vectors using deep learning. Some of their main capabilities include capturing complex linguistic relationships. And the key benefit is that it's the vectors that these embedding models create are efficient, manageable, and semantically rich. What this means is, as you scale to millions or even billions of vectors, you could still create effective search systems because these vectors will not only be unique in multidimensional space, but they will also accurately represent your original data. Now, some considerations you have to make when you're choosing an embedding model are balancing speed, accuracy, and computational needs. As you increase the number of dimensions, the accuracy increases, but so does your speed and compute. So if you're limited in latency and compute, then you might want to choose an embedding model with fewer dimensions, say 700. On the other hand, if your main priority is accuracy, then an embedding model with over a thousand dimensions might get you better results. Embeddings can be multimodal. Let's say you had some data in the form of audio, text, and images. You could unify those modalities to text, which means you take the audio and you turn that transcription into some vectors. You take the text and you say, use the same text embedding model to get some vectors. And then you can do the same thing by taking a video and then summarizing it. Now you've used the same embedding model for all of your data, which makes it very easy to manage and practice. But for some types of data, this doesn't work very effectively. So we have another option, which is using a multimodal model. Now a multimodal model can generate vectors from different types of data. For example, CLIP is a multimodal model that specializes in working with both image data and text data. What this means is that, let's say hypothetically you had a data set of 10 million images that you want to search. 
Well, clip can create a vector for each one of these images. And then once you have a user generating a query, you could use the same embedding model to search. Now, when the user has a query, like a cat in a green hat, you could turn that into a vector and you could use that vector to search your database and find all the images of cats in green hats. Now, the goal of similarity search is to find the top K closest documents to your query vector. But the documents returned in practice can be different depending on the similarity search method that we use. Some options that we have are Euclidean distance, cosine similarity, and dot product. Euclidean distance is the straight line distance between two vectors. It's very intuitive, but it can have lower performance at higher dimensions. Cosine similarity looks at the cosine of the angle between two vectors. It focuses on orientation rather than magnitude, which makes it very effective at higher dimensions. Let's say you had a query and some documents. Now, it's likely that the query is going to be formatted differently than the documents. It could be shorter in length, it could be structured as a question, while the documents are longer. Now, cosine similarity will ignore some of these length features and instead still find the documents that are relevant to the query. Dot product is the projection of one vector onto another. It is used in a wide variety of machine learning applications, but is often less effective at higher dimensions, even more so than Euclidean distance. Now, for more, most production applications, especially if you're doing retrieval augmented generation, you're likely using Euclidean distance and cosine similarity. And these two similarity metrics will likely have very similar performance, but you should try both and see which one is most effective for your specific use case. Vector search has a wide variety of use cases. What's exciting about vector search is that it allows you to create search systems that were inaccessible outside of big companies until a couple years ago. An obvious use case is document search. If we embed our query and embed our documents, likely by splitting them into chunks or section beforehand, it's very straightforward uh, to make a document search system. Another common use case is retrieval augmented generation or RAG. RAG is this idea that we want to ground our LLM with relevant data. If we have some sort of knowledge base for every single user to query, we could request and search the relevant data from our knowledge base and insert it into our large language model context to make sure the large language model not only doesn't make something up, but it has all the information that it needs. Another good use case is multimodal RAG. Modern large language models can understand not only text, but they could also understand images, and some can even understand audio. What this means is we could create vector search systems that search not only text, but other unstructured data as well. So what we could do is we could create a system that searches for images, text, audio, whatever we need to insert that as context into our multimodal model. Now, another good use case is recommendation systems. Whenever a user likes something, we could always find similar items to that. If a user likes an article, we could find semantically similar articles, which means we're just looking at the nearest neighbors to that article. We could also do pattern matching and outlier detection. This works by taking new data and seeing how different it is from the previous data that we've already seen. If it's very different, it's likely an outlier, and we should take a closer look at it. We could also do image similarity search. With models like Clip, it's very easy to use the same exact embedding model to embed both our images and our search query. So we could create very advanced image search systems extremely easily. One improvement that we could make over vector search is hybrid search. And hybrid search is this idea that we could take our traditional keyword search systems like BM25 sparse search, and sparse search just means keyword search in this case, and combine them with embedding vector search or dense vectors. And this way, we could create more effective search systems, especially for data sets that have a lot of domain specific language. And then finally, we have temporal similarity search. 
temporal similarity search is useful for identifying patterns in time series data, which is useful in fields like finance and climate science. In the next video, we'll dive into vector databases and how they solve some of the challenges in vector search. I really hope you found this video useful, and I'll see you next time.